TED India, which where I met Jay. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks. Uh, wonderful time being here in Singapore. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit. I, I, I think Je Jeff? Jeffrey? I'm going to talk to you a little bit about mindfulness. I'm just going to continue his discussion a little bit and uh, give you a different perspective on it, actually, from a different angle. I started out as an, as an engineer, but for the last couple of years, I've been focusing in the area of consciousness. Um, and what I mean by that is physically, um, you're all sitting in the audience. Physically, I'm standing on the stage. But in this conversation right now, we seem to be somewhere as well. And we, it seems like throughout the day, we've been taking on a long journey through all of these different wondrous adventure lands that we've, we've, we've been hearing. And so the question is, what is the relationship between this space that we're in right now, in the realm of our minds, and the physical bodies that make us who we are physically? And so this is the problem of consciousness. And there's an area of consciousness studies. And so I'd like to start this in, with a phenomenological experiment. What I'd like you to do, all of you in the audience here, and all of you out there in TV land, or internet land, is what I'd like you to do is just bring your full focus and attention on me right now. Just bring your full, you know, put the laptop down, put the cell phone down, stop tweeting for a second, and just bring your full attention and awareness to me right now. And then just relax, and just feel what this feels like. Right now, just focus on me here. Good. Thanks for putting the laptop down. <laughs> just focus on what this feels like. The sounds. Feel your breathing. Feel looking at my funny shoes. You can see all the peripheral motion. You can see all the things that are around. You can actually feel your legs. Feel your stomach. No, stay focused on me. No talking yet. Just bring your full awareness and attention on me. Thank you. <laughs> and just feel what this feels like. Just remember, let's sit with this experience for a second. Now, today is October 16th. Christmas is December 25th. How many days is it from today until Christmas exactly? Count it out. $10. 70. Huh? 70. Good, good. <laughs> that was an easy one, but the point that I want to make across that is that when I asked you to do the calculation, where did you go? Phenomenologically, what was your experience? When we're here and I ask you to focus on me, you can actually feel your body and you can hear all the sounds, you can hear the sounds and all the subtle motions all around. But when I ask you to do a calculation, a mental calculation, like count how many days until Christmas, what happened? Confused? Confused? <laughs> well, what happened? For, for you, what was your experience? What did you do? I started counting. Started counting. But when you started counting, where did you go? What was the experience of that? Physically, you're here. But could you still listen to this? And could you still see me? Or was the experience? No. You went somewhere else. But where is that? And that's what we're really looking at. And it turns out, we're there all the, the time. The difference between these two men seems obvious. Their faces are different, their hair is different, even their shirts are a different color. And yet an experiment by psychologists Dan Simons and Chris Chabri at Harvard reveals that our brains actually process very little of what comes in through the eyes. In this experiment, a subject comes up to a counter and a first experimenter hands them a consent form. As soon as they finish signing the consent form, they hand it back to the first experimenter, who then takes the consent form, ducks down behind the counter to put it away, and a different experimenter then stands up and hands the subject a packet of information and sends them into a hallway where we ask them questions. This wonderful experiment uncovers an aspect of the brain's attention system known as change blindness. Change blindness is the idea that we often miss large changes to our visual world from one view to the next. We're often not able to see large changes that would appear to be perfectly obvious to somebody who knows they're going to happen. 
And incredibly, in 75% of cases, the subjects don't notice a thing. The lady who took me up here, she opened the door for me and told me to walk over to the desk. Uh, this one. I, I think there was a sign that said experiment. Mm -hmm. And a man there gave me a form to sign. Mm -hmm. There was the guy standing under a big sign that said experiment. Mm -hmm. um, and to my left, there was like a pot with some mm -hmm. dirt in it and some plastic containers. Oh, I filled out a form. Okay. Right. How long would it be about before it? And I asked him how long it would take. He said about 10, 15 minutes or so. I guess I have the time. Did you notice anything unusual at all uh, after you signed the consent form? I just signed it and I didn't even pay attention to anything that was written on it. Okay. Um, <laughs> after, uh, uh, did you notice anything unusual happen at all? If you could just take this into the next no, one. No, I, uh, I probably wasn't even looking that direction. I probably got turned and looked towards the clear door. I saw some people there. Okay. And then I turned back and looked at him for a second. Okay. Did you notice anything unusual at all after you signed the consent form? No. This is only going to take five or ten minutes. Yeah. It'll, okay. take, it'll be real short. Okay. The person who stood up was actually a different person. Okay. Um, I gather you didn't notice yeah. that that was different. No. A different person actually stood up and handed you this form um, and sent you out toward me. Um, I gather from your reaction you didn't notice that? No. Okay. okay. Um, don't, don't feel bad about that, actually. Uh, most of the time, <laughs> the time of people don't notice. You see it? Yeah. The person who stood up with the packet was actually a different person. Wow. Then... <laughs> that is incredible. So I gather, I gather you didn't see it. I didn't catch that, no. Okay. What's really interesting is that some people notice these changes and other people don't notice these changes. Okay. If you could just take this. And we really don't yet have a good idea. What separates those people who don't from those people who do? It might be that there are individual differences in some of the to protect these sorts of changes. But it's also possible that it's just coincidence that the people who noticed it just happened to be focusing on a feature that changed. They just happened to be paying attention to the color of the person's shirt. And the people who failed to notice it just happen to be paying attention to something else. So it turns out, most of us, all the time, if you ever take public transport, in Hong Kong we call it the MTR, here you guys scramble it up a bit, it's the <laughs> MT, I think. But if you're there, most of the time, if you look at the pe people's faces, I don't know if they have the TV displays, but people are just kind of, most of the time, even probably during my talk right now, <laughs> you're in your mind. A lot of us are, are in our minds most of the time. And the danger for this is that if you look at how th are, we're wired it, on the emotion side, is that if you look at fear and anxiety, and this is especially for you that are college students here, <laughs> when you have exams coming up and everything, what happens is if, you, if we look at fear, if there was a lion physically here in this room, we should feel fear. And when we feel fear, our pupils dilate, our heart rate changes, our breathing changes, our, our digestion changes, the way that our blood flow changes throughout our physiology. And it's to prepare us to either fight, flee, or freeze. <laughs> but let's say the stock market goes down, and let's say my portfolio just goes down to nothing. You know, well, how am I going to pay rent? You know, all of these things come up. And it turns out, if we, if we understand the, the limbic system, it's the same chemicals that go through our body. Our, our heart rate will change, our breathing will change, our digestion changes. But you know what, these, these emotions that were built for us to be physically safe, there's nothing really threatening us. So it's, it's just chemicals going through our body. So we've got the, the uh, sympathetic nervous system that's activated that triggers all, it's like doing drugs, basically. You know, doing drugs. And so the issue is, and the interesting thing with this is that if we can bring ourselves fully present, and this is where the mindfulness thing is important, but if you can bring yourself fully present, and you'll notice with that exercise that we did, that if you can bring yourself fully present, right here and right now, everything's fine. Right? 
You, you may have that exam tomorrow that you haven't studied for yet. But at this moment right here and right now, everything is fine. Now, if you kick in the fear and the anxiety and all of this other stuff, it'll charge your energy up. But then all of the psychology comes in, right? If I, if I go into thought, into the past, you know, guilt, regret, anguish, remorse, humiliation, etc., future, fear, depression, anxiety, all of these other things on the imaginary side, um, we have nothing, fear, compulsion, insecurity, etc. But if you can bring yourself fully present, everything's fine. And the interesting thing with this is, from a neurobiological point of view, is that you can't be in thought and be present at the same time. So if I ask you, just look at me right now, just focus on me right now, just without changing, moving your eyes, what did you have for lunch four days ago? <laughs> well, well, so you'll notice that it turns out eye movement is correlated to memory access as well, too. And you can look at this when you're talking to people. Not only that, the direction that your eyes move, relate to what kind of memory access or what kind of thinking that you're doing. And so the interesting thing with this it is if you bring yourself fully present, there's no room for thought. Right? But you have full access to all of your feelings and all of the senses here. Now, when we do go into thought, where do we go? You know, so when you did the calculation, physically you're here, but where did you go? It's almost like there's an information space that we all have access to right now. We're, we're in the physical world, but we're also in this mental world. And this mental world is very rich. We can talk about Ted India, and, and um, Jay and I can talk about how we first met and everything, the bus ride and the conversations that we had, because we have, we're, we have, it seems like we have access to this common world, this common perception and this the common experience that we have access to. And it seems, like a, it seems like a world just as real as the physical world that we have here. And so the question is, where, what is this world like, and how did it come about? A lot of people talk about the last person on Earth. I like to think about the first person. So this is actually a painting of Adam. So man, someone became conscious, became aware of himself, and observes nature, and then builds a mental construction of what they see. You know, in this case, it's a flower. He comes up with... Uh, observes nature, which phusis is another word for that, builds a mental construct, and with that mental construct, he, they're able to represent this and to communicate it to another person. Not only, uh, but the issue with the re mental representation, it's an abstraction of what the reality, underlying reality, really is, and it's actually what that reality was before. It may have changed, but, you know, it's uh, kind of a frozen version of what the experience was. And so I can communicate, and then I can apply it, and I can create things based upon this. So we construct these models, and the, the sum of the world that we're in right now in this mental realm is the collection of all seven billion of us, and all the people in the past put together, all the books, everything, is this huge mental space, if you will. Okay? So there's nature... And then there's techne. So technology comes from the Greek word techne. And the Greeks were very careful to distinguish between phusis, which are things that come from nature, and techne, which have gone through the filter of the mind. Because it's gone through the filter of the mind, it's an abstraction, and it's a model of what the reality really, the underlying reality really is. And so if you think about Take a look at everything that you see right now. Every little thing, the position of the chair, this keyboard, all of the things that you see right now, right here, came from somebody's mind. If you think about it, or if you look at it. Most everything that you see in the world today, in the material world, is almost like a shadow projection of this cumulative mental space that we're in right now. So there's this mental space, and there's a correlation. The bag sitting there, my bag sitting there, I put it there, where I got it, all of this. Someone invented it. You know, so there's this accumulation of this mental stuff that has created the material world. Okay, and then I have a personal view, so I have a subset of this, this collective space that we have. And the material world is just a shadow projection. So if we're looking at solving the world's problems, it isn't really solving it here. It's actually solving it up here. Okay? 
So techne is a subset of fusis, but it works with fusis. But the collection of material reality is driven by either fusis, which is just nature, or techne, which has come from the mind. So if we look at the problems of the world today, you know, you look at the population. This is a frightening book published, The Human Impact on the Earth. And it's not only population, but if you look at deep forest, the pollution, deforestation, all of this, it's these exponential curves, right? And so where do these problems come from? <laughs> You've probably heard, if you heard um, Sir Ken Robinson's talk, he talks about, um, he gives a story where uh, Jonas Salk made the observation that if we got rid of all the insects on the planet, within 50 years, life would disappear on land. But if we got rid of all the people on the planet, Within 50 years, life would rebound. So what is it that's so essential about insects? And what is so destructive about man? Well, it turns out it's acting from the mind, from these mentally constructed things, versus from our true nature, arguably. A different kind of intelligence. And so this is a quote that in, in which we're trying to move towards, I think, is intuition and insight. You know, we're born with instinct, you know, so I can explain this scientifically. I might see a woman, oh, shoot, she's really hot, procreate, you know, I can explain it, instinct, etc. You know, so instinct we were born with. But then the intellect develops. She's hot. Wait, I'm married. <laughs> so instinct and intellect clash, right? And then intellect dominates the instinct. But then when you ask yourself, how did you choose your wife? Was it, well, intelligence, a beauty? <laughs> was it an intellectual decision? No. It was just, she was the one. It was, that was the right thing. It just felt right, right? And it's those kind of decisions, and if we can act from that at all times, from our nature, a knowing without knowing how you know, that's, that will, is what I think will move us into well, it's this natural intelligence. So in a sense, all the, there are 50 trillion cells in your body. They're all working together right now without you even thinking about it. And they'll you cut yourself, it'll heal automatically. A lot of things, there's a natural homeostasis. There's a movement, there's nature that's, that's moving things. And the same things that are guiding the cells in your body are the same forces that are creating the new, the new stars in, the, in, the, in the, the new galaxies in the universe. And so there is this natural intelligence. Many of you may have seen Joe Bolte Taylor's talk as well, too, really looking at the relationship between the left side of the brain and, and, and just presence. And so, and if you do any neurosciences, I won't go into it, but Benjamin Libet, or if you've read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, in a sense, the body knows before the mind does. And the thing is that if you can bring yourself fully present and everything's fine, you'll find out that joy is a natural state. So the, and so if you look at the mentally constructed reality, and Daniel Kahneman gave a great talk about the remembering self versus the experiencing self. And so underneath this conditioned reality that we put in our mind that are in thoughts and the ideas that we have is an underlying inner experience that right here and right now, it's good to be alive. <laughs> and the thing is that if you can feel that, and it's available to you at any time, and if you can work from that, Work from that joy, that, the wonder, the, 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 the gratitude, you know, the, the amazement of, you know, here I am in Singapore and I've run out of time. <laughs> it's great to, you know, having said that, it's great to be alive here. Probably not for Jay and the next speaker, but for me right now, it's really good. And so the key thing with this, too, is that the map, the ideas and the language that we've created and the beliefs that we have are not the territory, are not the experience of this moment. And they're completely different. We can use it to communicate, and they make great, uh, great tools, but they make poor masters. If you're using the model of the mind, of the um, intellectually constructed model, you know, it's useful for communicating, but if you're using that to govern your life, let that go. Whatever your mother said, you know, they, they love you and everything. <laughs> Just kind of let that go a little bit. You know, and find your own passion, like Lakshmi was saying, too. And so the question is, and... I've got a lab in Hong Kong, and we're doing a lot of stuff using video games to really look at the relationship between the mind and the body. Because the premise is, what if everyone acted from joy rather than fear, need, and desire, which, which motivate most of the people today? What would happen? 